Das Studio damals von Kraftwerk, das war ein, ein, im Hinterhof ein äh, größerer Raum. Das war vielleicht früher mal ein Fabrikraum, könnte ich mir denken. Das war äh, ganz abgeschottet mit einem, von einem äh, Rolltor. Das berühmte Rolltor, glaube ich, äh, als ich zum ersten Mal dahin kam, äh, da wurde dann plötzlich, ich habe geläutet und dann ging so langsam ein ganz schweres Rolltor auf. Dann äh, ging man da rein, noch durch so einen Gang. Und dann kam man in diesen Raum, der war ziemlich groß, der hatte keine, der war nicht irgendwie getüncht. Und da standen dann vereinzelt, stand zum Beispiel ein riesiger, riesiger Hornlautsprecher, der war selbst gebaut, ich glaube der Florian hat das mal gemacht, oder bauen lassen viel auch, die haben sich sehr viel bauen lassen von Freunden, die sie da hatten. Dann so, diese Elektroniktrams gab es noch nicht, aber so verschiedene verschiedene Geräte, die selbst gebaut waren und dann eben auch diese einfachen Synthesizer, die man damals hatte, Synthia ja, war da und dann standen halt diese ganzen, dann war so Ralf und Florian mit, äh, mit Neon, das war alles schön aufgebaut, ne? das ist ja auch ziemlich bekannt, glaube ich, diese, 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 diese Schrift auf, äh, aus Neon, da hatten sie auch eine Firma, die das extra für sie gemacht hat. Ralf und Florian hatten immer die richtigen Freunde, die, äh, die genau wussten, wie die die Technik beherrschen. Da gehörte dann der Conny auch dazu. Der Conny war wichtig im Studio und das alles äh, perfekt zu machen. Ich nehme an, dass das äh, später genauso gut gemacht wurde, aber äh, der, damals war Conny für die, für die Aufnahmen doch sehr wichtig. Und Ralf und Florian hatten immer diese Bekannten oder äh, Studiomenschen und äh, auch Bastler durchaus, die ihnen diese, diese Technik so hergestellt haben, wie sie das brauchten. Das ging so weit bis zu den Cases, wo die, die Sachen rein Die wurden extra angefertigt, so, so aus, aus, aus Alu, Alu-Behälter, wo man dann zu den Gigs mit diesen Alu-Behältern fuhr. Das war, glaube ich, sehr wichtig auch. Und die elektronischen Geräte eben wurden auch gebaut. The result of their labors was the album Autobahn. Released in Germany and the UK at the tail end of 1974, it was the last LP that Ralph and Florian would record with producer Connie Plank. And it was the album that catapulted them onto the international stage. At its center was the title track, a 20-minute opus that took up the whole of the record's first side. The duo would eventually dismiss their first three albums, and they chose to reimagine this record as Kraftwerk Year Zero. The ideal thing was that, that in Autobahn, it really had a subject matter that combined all the ideas they were thinking of. Uh, That was the, 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 the genius thing about it, that, they, that, the, that the, all of a sudden they had a subject matter. So far they were these conceptualists were thinking about ideas of, of how to be an artist or how to be a musician in, in the pop world with all these, these visual artists' concepts around. Uh, but they didn't have a concept matter. They didn't have a subject matter. And then they, the idea of the Germanness was the next thing, but that was still something that had to be uh, concretized every time in a specific way. And here they had everything together. They had a highly musical subject matter, the road. Then the specific German version of it was this problematic thing, you know, the, the, the proverbial uh, achievement of the fascists, you know, that, that it's always this, this kind of proverbial talk of the, 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 the German after the Second World War said, yeah, Hitler wasn't so bad after all. Uh, I mean, he shouldn't have done this with the, with the Jews, but at least he built the Autobahn, and that's this kind of... So Autobahn is, means this too. Uh, and then, of course, it's uh, um, this, the, the musical aesthetic of that, something that takes from minimalism the unfinishedness of, of music, music that, is, that has a structure that's not saying uh, there's a climax and at one point we come to an end, but it's possibly endless. All this together was, uh, was a great moment. Autobahn is, I think Ralph Woodcher has, has said that, you know, he was very much influenced by the Beach Boys, and in this particular case, and he says that the Beach Boys, to him, made music that sounded like America, and he wanted a music that sounded like Germany, that he was going to make, and it's a kind of tone poem, and it's a, you know, it's a very sort of picturesque piece of music, and there is, a, there is this kind of conscious homage to the Beach Boys, um, Fahn, 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 it's like, 
which travel, as in we travel, 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 you know, slightly awkward German, like fun, 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 until Daddy takes the T-bird away. So there's that kind of conscious allusion to the Beach Boys. Um, but what's wonderful about the main piece, and I think that really is the essence of, of the album, these sort of, uh, over its 17, 18 minutes or whatever, is that you just get this, um, it's like a sonic transcription of a car journey from the kind of ignition and setting off, and then kind of bowling sort of nicely along the road, then hitting heavy traffic. It would have seemed perhaps a very odd subject matter to some of the people that have maybe followed sort of crap rock generally or sort of the alternative German rock scene, uh, for somebody to be kind of offering a hymn of praise to something like a motorway. But Kraftwerk, you know, they, they do these things with a very, very wry smile. They're probably kind of aware of the kind of hackles they're raising when they do these things and they kind of pose they're looking slightly effeminate and very un-rock and roll. But um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, as well as being an exquisite piece of music, it's uh, very cleverly provocative as well. What was happening with Audubon was that the actual, before when you heard the, the sounds, you knew it was coming from a source and that somebody was trying to make a sound coming from the source and said, that's a treated guitar or that's an oscillator or that's a keyboard. But with Audubon, you sort of forgot about what the instrument sounded like. I just were more just, just completely caught up in, the, in the, this motoric melody and this, this driving motoric rhythm and then this melody and then the voice going Audubon over. And the whole thing gelled into like what you call music where you actually forget about the instrument and you just listen to the music itself and you're, you're brought along with the music. I think certainly the first side of Audubon they become like really great musicians but then the second side of Audubon, for some reason, uh, they go back to experiment, whether these experiments were experiments that were lying around or stuff that was old stuff that they hadn't finished. But really the second side is probably a side that people don't listen to because it's going back to the Crawford 1 and 2 experiments. But certainly the, the first side made them international for the time, pop stars. The wesentlich point hat ja Conny Blank gespielt. The wesentlich role der eigentlich alles gemixed hat und wirklich einzelne Teilchen zusammengesetzt hat und hinterher wurde dann das Stück draus. Und das war, glaube ich, sogar die letzte, das letzte Mal, dass, dass, sie, dass Conny das gemacht hat. Und er hat nur noch zu mir gesagt, er, kann sich, er wüsste nicht genau, wie dein Kraftwerk klingt, wenn er das nicht mehr macht. Das war schon sehr wichtig auch. I'm, I'm quite sure um, that the idea was making a statement on the realm of pop music but with our German identity and if you listen closely to the first uh, two records of Ralph and Florian uh, they really came from this classical angle uh, that's how I see it and then they moved towards pop music of course by adding lyrics there's no pop music without lyrics apparently and by using the German lyrics and using this, this word fun, which could be understood in the English language as fun. And you had this connection to the, the Beach Boys, to fun on the Autobahn, and using some of these German idioms like Autobahn and stuff like that, using the picture of the Volkswagen and the Mercedes-Benz, that opened up a door, a new door. And I think uh, that that's part of the success of, of Autobahn, of the first uh, worldwide selling Kraftwerk record, actually. This articulation of German identity was not only a key ingredient of the track's success abroad, but also restated Kraftwerk's difference to their contemporaries. While the other German bands were keen to distance themselves from their homeland, Kraftwerk's use of lyrics sung in their native tongue would be a real rarity not only on the UK and US charts. This was novelty in German too, because uh, if you were singing in German, you were immediately part of another tradition, uh, another tradition of German pop music, the Schlager culture. And the Schlager culture is, is something that, uh, that was always uh, um, right wing and um, uh, even worse than right wing, partly. It was, it was um, definitely reactionary. So singing in German was, was politically impossible. Klischees, die der 
die deutsche Popmusik, also der Schlager hat, der eine sehr formalisierte Sprache hat, in der also in ganz klaren Formeln über Liebe, Heimat, äh, solche Dinge verhandelt wird. Da wird über Liebe gesprochen, aber in so einer äh, kalten, festgelegten Form, dass es mit irgendwelchen realen Menschen und einer realen Liebe gar nichts mehr zu tun hat. Äh, deshalb Kraftwerk karikiert. Oder so hat man sie hier in Deutschland gehört, ihre offensichtlich unsinnigen Texte, äh, die auch keinen, nicht den Versuch machten, irgendwie äh, tiefsinnig zu sein. Äh, und zwar so offensichtlich, dass es dann wieder ein, ein künstlerisches Statement war. Äh, es war eine Karikatur des Schlagers, so wie ihre äh, Krawatten, ihre Frisuren eine Karikatur des disziplinierten, fleißigen Deutschen waren. Despite such culturally specific elements, the record became a massive hit in the US and the UK. After being picked up by a radio station in Chicago, the Autobahn single hit the top 30 in the US and the album reached the top five on both sides of the Atlantic. It was a huge record and it allowed them to then tour, you know, in America and so on. For the first time they could actually go and tour in the States, which was like a, a huge breakthrough, yes, of course. And I think, uh, for the first time, Americans and British could see that some German music was really, really fantastic to hear and, and, and friendly and warm and wasn't, as, as Ian MacDonald had said many years later, cold and unemotional. It was very emotional and it was very funny as well. Before departing for the tour, the structure of the group changed once more. Keen on the more expansive sound as well as the image of a four-piece, when Klaus Ruder quit the group, he was instantly replaced with another percussionist music student Karl Bartos. Well, my professor said, uh, hey Karl, it was 75. I've got this telephone call now. There's this band called Kraftwerk. Uh, they need a classical trained percussionist. Here's the number, call them. And I called back and actually it was Florian Schneider on the phone and at that time we were all very casual. So I got phone calls every day playing there, playing there, playing there. And I got there, and I just, as far as I remember, I, I took my vibraphone. I had a vibraphone, and Florian came to my flat, and we were carrying this vibraphone to the Klinklan studio. They put some uh, sheet music in front of me, and it was a song, as far as I remember, it was Komet Melody. So it was basically a major scale. I was playing this from the sheet music, and a little riff here, a little riff there. And we were laughing, had some fun, and that was it. I was in the band. Kraftwerk arrived in the US in April for the 22-day tour. And now performing as a four-piece, the band all adopted short hair and dressed in suits, a collective ensemble for the first time, and an antithesis of everything rock was about in America. Yet many in the audience viewed them very much as a passing musical fad. I think at that time we were some sort received as some sort of gimmick group. Only very few people uh, could could foresee what what was uh, what potential was in Kraftwerk. I think they, even though we we played in Detroit, we, we played almost everywhere. At that time, it was too far out, too strange. We were playing in suits. Suits, short hair, I, play, I was playing electronic drums. We had a mini MOOC, Ralph was playing a mini MOOC. A Fafisa organ, I still have it. I nicked it off him, so it's in my uh, basement collecting dust. And Florian was playing an ARP Odyssey synthesizer and, and, and Wolfgang and me we were playing electronic drums and my vibraphone, of course. And it was a very odd performance, very, very odd, I think. Despite the strangeness of the experience, the single, the album and the tour were highly lucrative for Hutter and Schneider, and they reinvested their profits back into Kling Klang Studios. Here they returned to work on a new album, and as with Autobahn, it would again center on a single concept. You know, after Sgt. Pepper, everybody was doing concept records, and it became a little bit out of fashion. 
then. And I think uh, looking at the classical composers like, like Cage, Stockhausen, there was always a strong concept behind their work. It's, it's impossible to make really good music without a concept, even if you go to a strong music coming from other cultures, like Indian music or whatever, there's always a strong concept behind it, which is deeply based in their ethnical background. And being part of, uh, we, we always felt really as Germans later really more uh, as Europeans. And of course, coming also from the classical background, you have to come up with, with a thought, with a theme, we always went into a production of a record and we put pictures on the, on, the, uh, on the console. We always had some pictures around. And, you know, if you, even if you improvise music, if you sing a track, if you make some la-las, it's always good if, you, if your mind is in a direction. It's much better if you l look metaphorically in one direction instead of being nowhere. It's always good being somewhere if you do, if you play music. And uh, that was one of the strongest parts of Kraftwerk and that's why I really felt, felt uh, very good being part of, of this movement and being part of Kraftwerk actually, yeah. Working solely out of the improved cling-clang, the context in which the band would now function had changed. Having negotiated a new deal with EMI, Hutter and Schneider took over production duties on their records. Although both Fleur and Bartos were brought on board the sessions for the new album, the control over Kraftwerk product was now entirely in the hands of Ralph and Florian. From radioactivity on, Ralph and Florian became the producer of Kraftwerk, so they took this part. And uh, it felt very natural because it was not at that time. I haven't, I hadn't really uh, the feeling it was teamwork. It was just Ralph and Florian's record. Kraftwerk was just. I would, I would say, I was part-time Kraftwerker. <laughs> Although it opened up really a possibility for the future, but I didn't know at that time. 